let's uh, let's move on to uh, Professor Bush. Are are you ready, John? You think? Uh, you're still muted. I am ready. Muted but ready. Muted but ready. Uh, yeah. So John is a professor of math at MIT. Uh, he's been working on these hydrodynamic analogs of of quantum behavior that are very very interesting through his pilot wave work and um really has inspired a lot of thinking about the relation between the fluctuations of the background in the in the in the pilot wave and its relation to the quantum vacuum kind of is a, it's sort of a natural tie there i think um anyway so uh thank you john for uh, agreeing to Give us a talk and looking forward to it. Pleasure, thank you. Okay, let me share a screen here. <clears throat> and I apologize for not being as present as I would like during this meeting, but it's it's been a, br a brutal time. I just recovering from a little uh, tussle with COVID last week. So. Oh, bummer. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> yeah. So. So yes, I'll be talking today about hydrodynamic uh, quantum analogs, and um, uh, let me see here. Do I? Is that? Are you guys? Is that? Is that okay? What do you see now? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It looks good. Yeah, and we can see your cursor. Okay. You, you can't see the images behind. I'm just trying to close. I'm no. No. Losing yeah. Zoom for a while. So. Uh, I mean, I think we should. Okay, that's fine. So yeah, I just want to thank all of the pe many people who've contributed. So I've been working on this now for 10 years. So it was work started by Yves Couder and Emmanuel Four in Paris. And I've collaborated with many of their groups and then my own group. And um, um, I've been, this has been funded by the NSF and also the Limitless Space Initiative most recently and uh, several other uh, sources of funding. And there have been uh, uh, lots of, postdocs and uh, grad students coll collaborating. Yuval Dagan, you heard from earlier today, um, uh, being foremost among them. So let's move on. So again, quantum mechanics is a theory which predicts the, describes the, stati the statistics of microscopic particles, but does not describe their trajectory. So we're really interested in developing a, uh, a picture of individual particles moving along paths. So the standard quantum description um, you'll get in an undergraduate quantum books is basically associating a particle with a wave. So you have um, a particle has an associated frequency and associated wavelength, but where is the blasted particle and why is it moving? So um, these are the sort of commonsensical questions that one naturally asks oneself as, a, as a, an undergraduate and that we're hoping to uh, revisit. Okay. And the main problem, in my view, of uh, state of quantum affairs is is the insistence from some people that it's a complete description. Of course, this leads immediately to all sorts of um, uh, paradoxes and troubling language and the proliferation of uh, quantum interpretations. Okay, so in terms of um, hidden variable theories, these are theories that. Uh, uh, attempt to describe the particle trajectory. So basically particle position and, and momentum. Um, and it turns out that just historically, all of these um, attempts um, to de develop hi hidden variable theories involve interactions between particles and waves. Um, so this prior to the notion of hidden variable uh, theories being uh, um, created, there was de Bruyne's theory, which uh, involved basically a particle um, an, uh, with an internal oscillation interacting with the background field and so self-propelling, um, uh, accompanied by a monochromatic wave field. Bohm had a, also had a, a, a pilot wave theory, which wasn't as rich dynamically as de Bruyne's, and he imagined the particle being guided by a wave, basically the wave being the wave function of standard quantum mechanics. So it's really a sort of a recasting of a statistical theory into a dynamical theory. And Nelson proposed stochastic dynamics, so, so where you can imagine particle motion as being a sort of random walk through interaction with some sort of background field, presumably the quantum vacuum. And uh, the most developed um, pilot wave theory comes from the realm of stochastic electrodynamics. So De La Peña and Cheto have developed the, this theory whereby, again, a particle has an internal oscillation at the Compton frequency and interacts with the background 
uh, electromagnetic quantum vacuum. Okay, and so <clears throat> this, uh, I was sort of, I've been led to this field. I was interested in quantum foundations as a, as a student, um, uh, but I went off and did fluid dynamics. And then lo and behold, in 2005, uh, Yves Couder and Emmanuel Ford discover this hydrodynamic pilot wave system in which a particle moves in resonance with the guiding wave. So it's a, in some sense a realization of de Broglie's mechanics from the 1920s, uh, which was never a completed theory. I think the, the way that Yuval has, has pushed it is sort of the, what needs to be done to modernize it. Now, uh, what's remarkable about this hydrodynamic system is it does exhibit many features of quantum systems that were thought to be exclusive to the uh, microscopic realm. So the questions naturally raised are what are the key dynamical features responsible for the quantum-like behavior that we know. We have a handle on that. Um, uh, the, let me see, hide video panel. Oh, look at that, it's like hide, look at, uh, okay, there are now in business. Okay, and so, um, you know, so what are the potentials of this hydrodynamic system as a quantum analog? So what are its limitations? We expect there to be some, but we haven't run into them just yet. Um, and can it guide us towards a rational theory of quantum dynamics? So we're sort of going in the opposite order. It would have been more sensible for me to go uh, first uh, before Yuval, but I, I had to lecture this morning, unfortunately. So, um, so he showed uh, basically the system is this vibrating bath of fluid and above a critical acceleration, uh, which is around four times gravity. So the vibration, when the vibrational acceleration exceeds this critical value, you get standing Faraday waves. All of the experiments are done below this Faraday threshold. So the interface would be flat in the absence of a drop, but they put, we put a, a fluid drop on the surface. So the original experiments, they just uh, use a toothpick, you create a drop and it can support itself on the free surface going to the sustenance of this air layer between the drop and the bath. Okay, and all of the action happens when there's a period. So initially the drop, so there, of course, if you don't draw, um, if the vibrational acceleration is insufficient, it will simply coalesce. But you can see here, it's basically bouncing with the driving frequency. But then when you uh, increase the driving acceleration, the period will increase to the point that it doubles. And when it doubles, then you get a resonance between the bouncing motion and the subharmonic wave field. Um, and, and that's when all the action happens. So then the waves are very persistent on the, on the surface. They're basically, the drop is then exciting the Faraday waves, which are the most unstable. And so that's when you get the transition to the walking. And as Yuval mentioned, the key feature of this system is memory. And basically the bath serves as the memory of the system. Okay, so the drop responds locally, all the dynamics is local. The, um, described by Navier-Stokes equations, the particle moves in response to the slope of the wave, um, but that slope is determined by its past. So in order to, when you write down the trajectory equation, there's a memory term because the slope depends on the waves generated along its path. Okay, so but that's the key feature uh, that gives rise to all the quantum effects is the fact that the system is non-Markovian, that is to say hereditary, the instantaneous force acting on the particle depends on its history. Okay? And we call this memory. Okay, and so this uh, manifests in the, <clears throat> this memory is manifest in the uh, trajectory equation. So that this memory parameter here uh, is, this is the decay, the viscous decay time of the waves. This is the Faraday period. And this is the driving acceleration here. So as we approach the Faraday threshold, the memory becomes very long, that is to say that the waves are very persistent because they the memory prescribes the rate of decay of these wave fields. So the 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 force, um, we just have this, so you have the inertial term, you have the drag term, and then you have this propulsive wave force term, which is again proportional to the slope of the wave field. The wave field is prescribed by, is basically corresponds to the superposition of Bessel functions generated along the particle path uh, which decay at a rate prescribed by the system memory. <clears throat> and so if we strobe the system, we basically see it riding along, surfing its quasi-monochromatic wave field. The dominant wave field is, uh, the dominant wavelength is the corresponds to the Faraday wavelength. Mm -hmm. And this is a sort of physical picture that the Breuil had. And again, this, and it's a, certainly a macroscopic realization of wave particle duality, which in the, uh, when used in the quantum, world is rather ill-defined. Okay, and so uh, we can describe this strobe dynamics. 
simply by averaging the full dynamics, which includes the vertical motion of the drop. So we can just, um, and as a mathematical approximation, uh, we can um, assume that the particle is, a constant, is constantly creating waves as it goes along its path. So we can turn the discrete sum into this uh, integral. And so you see again, the, this memory term. So this, the instantaneous wave force acting on the drop depends on its history. And this is where all of the dynamical richness comes from and all of the uh, quantum behavior. So <laughs> the first analog was that of uh, Kuder and Floor, which is, and this has been revisited by our group and uh, another group in um, Denmark. And this is uh, beyond dispute. You send a particle, you uh, send particles one at a time and you get single particle diffraction. So this is the sum top right. We see the sum total of this is the um, angle of, uh, sorry, angle of uh, deflection along the horizontal axis. And this is the number of particles deflected in that way. And uh, we also saw that in the case of the double slit, the, um, uh, the presence of the second slit changes the diffraction pattern, okay? And so this is something which is widely thought to be impossible to understand but it's, uh, it's manifest on the macroscopic scale through this system. And this is really the paper that got the ball rolling. Okay, and we've also looked at uh, scattering of these walkers from submerged topography. Here we have a submerged pillar and we thought, oh, it's just gonna scatter in some way. It does scatter, but it remarkably locks into a logarithmic spiral. And so you can then ask the question, well, what force applied by this pillar can give rise to this uh, trajectory. And so the conceit is always, oh, let's pretend we don't know that there's a pilot wave. What would we infer? Well, we would infer that there's a non-local force being acted. So the particle will follow that trajectory if it's acted upon by this lift force. Um, and so uh, this lift force is proportional to the instantaneous velocity crossed with the instantaneous angular velocity of the pillar around the post. So it's kind of an interesting force in that it looks like, so it's a lift force, but it looks like self-induction because if you use this analogy between the Coriolis force for a particle for mass moving in a rotating frame and a charge moving in a magnetic field, it looks like a charge moving in response to the magnetic field associated with its own current, okay? So it, that's kind of a quirky thing that we're trying to better understand. We're now looking at walkers interacting with uh, rotating um, <clears throat> with rotating obstacles. But in any case, you can see how in this situation, if you denied the fact that there was a pilot wave, if you were not aware of it, you would infer action at a distance. So this particle is somehow responding to the, this pillar uh, in a non-local way, right? Uh, so another example of uh, the misinference of non-local forces comes in the following analogy, so Friedel oscillations happen when you, when basically on the surface of metal, you have electrons zipping around. And if you have um, a magnetic anomaly, then these electrons will scatter off it. And you see these, this well-defined wave structure and these have the deploy wavelength. Um, and there is no, of course, description of the part trajectories of the particles, just this statistical description, which can be rationalized uh, use, uh, you just use uh, the appropriate scattering potential and Schrodinger's equation. Um, and so we thought to tr try for this, tr uh, try and capture an analog with the hydrodynamic setting. So here we see a walker approaching now, instead of a submerged pillar, we have a well. So it's a relatively deep region, which causes the drop to spiral in along an Archimedean spiral. So again, you get the sort of non-local lift force, uh, but more interestingly, uh, you excite speed oscillations as the particle moves. And as a result, in the fullness of time, there's a correlation between position and speed in, this, uh, in the plane. And so as a result, there's a statistical signature, which looks for all the world like that of Friedel oscillations. So basically, again, as the particle passes through the center, speed oscillations are excited. And so you see these concentric rings corresponding to high and low speed regions and therefore high, a low and high density uh, respectively. And so this looks, you know, even <clears throat> quantitatively like the uh, Friedel oscillations from quantum mechanics and the, uh, you know, the, you're going from angstroms to millimeters. So it's a massive range of scales and the weakest, the most conservative 
um, conclusion one can make is that Friedel oscillations are not inconsistent with the notion of particle trajectories. Okay, and so another early analog was the um, uh, that of walkers in a rotating frame. So if you have a particle moving uh, at uniform speed v in a rotating frame, you expect it to follow an inertial orbit with the radius prescribed by v over two omega. So as the rotation rate omega increases, uh, if you have uniform speed, as is the case for the walkers, then their radius will decrease with increasing rotation. So that's what happens in the uh, low memory limit. So uh, the, the radius tightens up as the rotation rate increases, but at high memory, the particle starts interacting with its own field. So basically it's self field. So it's moving in its own wake and it, so it's then moving on this corrugated free surface which is again, concentric waves centered on the center of the orbit. And so the particle then is only stable in certain orbits, certain circular orbits, which basically correspond to the troughs of its wave field, okay? And so you have this preference for these orbital, for these quantized orbits um, and the, uh, orbit, uh, the quantization length is uh, as in all of these analogs, the Faraday wavelength, okay? And so, there is, a, again, this analogy between the Coriolis force and the Lorentz force allows you to draw an analogy between these inertial levels, which we call Coudert levels, to the uh, Larmor levels in uh, quantum mechanics. And once again, the Faraday wavelength plays the role of the Debray wavelength. And so we can, we've can we analyzed this uh, system. So we take our trajectory equation, we throw in the Coriolis force, we look, uh, we find orbits and we assess their stability. So we find or circular orbits, assess their stability, and so we have a basically a solution curve saying, and we can look to see how the stability of the system changes, how the preferred orbits change as a function of uh, memory. So as the memory increase, so you get a, the classical result um, uh, at the low, in the low memory limit, as the memory increases, there are unstable branches on the solution curve. So this is theory versus experiment. And then at, at higher memory, the solutions become progressively more unstable. Um, and so ultimately things become chaotic in the high memory limit. And this chaos is not without structure. Um, as we move from the circular orbit to this more complex path, basically the drop jumps between uh, accessible uh, unstable circular orbits. And so if you plot the radius of curvature as a function of time, you can see that there are these plateaus which correspond to sort of preferred uh, orbital states. And because all of them are unstable, but the, ultimately the statistics is prescribed by the relative instability of these unstable circular orbits. And so the, the sort of question raised here is, can uh, quantum statistics be underlaid by um, chaotic pilot wave dynamics? So, there, it's, so the, from the pilot wave dynamics, you get the quantization and you also get the structured statistics. Okay, and so <clears throat> another interesting feature we saw there is the possibility of, so when the solution curve touches down on the vertical axis, that corresponds to omega or zero. So it's indicating that there's a possibility of a drop just being trapped and zipping around in its own wave field. So we've sort of seen some vestiges of this in the lab, but they seem to be just unstable. Uh, but again, the, it, you don't have to stretch your imagination too much to imagine a parameter regime in which you can get a particle stabilized and confined by its own wave field. And you can imagine that the number of such high dynamic spin states would be countable. Okay, and so another early uh, analog of Coudere's was this uh, walker moving in a central force, basically a central spring force. So the particles, these walkers always wanna move in a straight line, but if they're being confined by a radial spring force, then they'll execute orbits and they can be circular orbits, as you see here in black, or um, so here, are, uh, or you can get more complex orbits like these Lemnis gates um, or these trefoils. And this is, uh, you can see that there's these orbits are basically quantized in angular momentum and radius, which is a proxy for energy. So the quantization is reminiscent of that in quantum mechanics. And once again, so again, the quantization comes from the, uh, quasi monochromatic wave field. And then when the system becomes chaotic, it basically drifts between these unstable orbital states, giving rise to quantum like statistics. And the, and the turning point for me, this was actually our first experiment. I've not gone chronologically here, but this is the, the corral 
experiments, which uh, Yuval touched upon. So again, note the uh, this is um, the scale here is 75 angstroms in quantum mechanics, and we're basically looking at something which is uh, centimeters in scale. So vast difference in scales. This is what they get when electrons zip around on the surface of a metal confined by positive uh, atoms um, in our uh, walking droplet system. Uh, the particle follows this trajectory, and I thought this is too much of a mess. We're never going to get anything coherent uh, statistically, but you let the thing run. The beauty is you let the thing run for about half an hour. So the time scale, despite the vast difference in, in scales between the quantum system and this one, you actually get uh, analogous behavior. And all of the time scales are accessible from the bouncing, which is so it's bouncing about 50 times per second to this time scale of statistical convergence is about uh, on the order of an hour. So you can actually get everything in the lab, which is, I think, a, a miracle of sorts. So um, here we see the emergent PDF is basically um, uh, very comparable to that in the, in the quantum system. But here we can see that, it, that it's rooted in the velocity variations um, associated with the pilot wave dynamics. Okay, and so the sort of physical picture is that of, uh, you know, again, I mentioned these three, the three time scales. There's the time scale of the bouncing, then there's this basically the time scale that it takes to cross its domain, and then there's the time scale of statistical convergence. And remarkably, so this, the, the, the fast scale you can see with the high speed camera, uh, this you can see with the naked eye, and this only takes on the order of an hour. So uh, we were very lucky there. It could, just as you know, this time scale, scale, time, uh, scale of statistical convergence could have been a week, in which case we would have been out of luck. So, um, so we also we revisited this uh, these corral experiments with um, uh, Pedro Sainz, who was an outstanding uh, instructor in the department, and he's now on the faculty at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And so we see again this correlation between position and speed giving rise to this robust statistical form and we also found that we can get a mixture of states and project them using topography and so capture something akin to the so-called quantum mirage and uh, but the reason <coughs> I, I wanted to show this particular study is we it, it kind of pointed in the pointed out an interesting thing because at any given instant the the wave uh, is very complicated so it doesn't correspond to a mode of the cavity for example. Uh, but if you average it, it does. In fact, there's a very strong relation between the average wave field and the particle histogram. So, um, in uh, so this is basically again would be described by the wave function in um, quantum mechanics. And so, it, it uh, my view is that this uh, it's pretty clear that the average wave field takes the same form. So, what can we how can we rationalize? What we want to do is rationalize, you know, make the connection between the dynamics and the statistics. Okay. So this turns out to be in this case, it's a superposition of two modes of the cavity. So the statistical behavior we get from superposing two modes. Um, and so we can actually relate the um, average wave field to the particle histogram. Uh, if we assume so the particle generates the same wave field at each impact. And so you expect then that the average wave field is going to be the convolution of the um, wave field of a bouncer and its histogram, right? Because, um, and so this, this, so this uh, wave field is the form of the bouncer wave field. That's basically the wave field you get if the drop was bouncing uh, for an infinite amount of time in at the same place. And so that form of that will depend on memory. And then in some sense, how often does it bounce uh, at a given position? That's information is given here by the uh, basically the PDF of the particle uh, position. And so we have this relation now between this mean uh, pilot wave potential and the, and the statistics. And so why is this an important quantity? Because on average, the particle is seeing the average wave field. And this average wave field, it turns out, depends on the statistics. And we'll see that this has, this is uh, sort of evokes Bohmian mechanics, where they have a particle being pushed around by a statistical wave. OK, and so just from uh, observation, what we find is that, so as we saw in the corral, typically the instantaneous wave field differs from 
the mean. So here we have a particle just moving along um, uh, the x-axis. So this is time in this direction. So it's basically just moving back and forth at, at sort of moderate memory. And this is the mean uh, wave field here in black. And so at any given instant, the wave field varies <clears throat> substantially from the mean and the particle sort of drifts back and forth, but at really high memory. So the uh, when when the waves are most persistent, the particle, the, the instantaneous wave field basically locks onto the mean. And so you have this particle exploring this mean pilot wave potential, which is non-local because it depends, of course, on the statistics, right? So you have this sort of mixing of dynamics and statistics, which is quite interesting and allows us to connect to uh, BOMI mechanics. Okay, so um, these we basically now have three paradigms for macroscopic quantum behavior. And so the key dynamical feature is this resonance between the particle and the wave, which ensures a quasi monochromatic wave field. Um, so we see the uh, basically the drop is navigating this non local potential that is its pilot wave. So, for example, the mean pilot wave potential. Again, I say it's non local because it depends actually on the statistics of the system. Okay. And so um, now <laughs> we've seen in orbital uh, pilot wave dynamics, the, the quantization comes from the dynamic constraint imposed on the droplet by its monochromatic wave field. And then you get the chaotic, the, when the system go, go, becomes uh, chaotic, the drop basically drifts between these unstable uh, orbital state, quantized orbital states, giving rise to quantum like statistics. We've also seen in the Friedel, case of Friedel oscillations, you have these speed fluctuations leading to correlation between position and speed. And so you get a statistical signature uh, with the Faraday wavelength. And then there's another limit, which we can get at actually numerically, where you get this sort of random walk, where there's a diffusivity, which is prescribed by the product of the walker speed and the Faraday wavelength. And this is comparable to what was suggested by uh, uh, Nelson in his stochastic mechanics. Okay. So we have this long growing list of um, grocery list of hydrodynamic quantum analogs, and it is uh, ever growing. And but we see that you know there are limitations, and we can see uh, what they are. The main limitation is the viscous damping of the pilot wave. So these quantum features always emerge at high memory when the waves are very persistent and you're close to the Faraday threshold. We've also seen that the drop inertia can dominate the wave force, in which case these um, uh, quantum effects are, are minimized. So that's, for example, why the spin states are unstable. But we can very easily, you know, now that we have a theoretical description of the hydrodynamic setting, we can say, okay, well, let's take a flyer and uh, look at a broader class of pilot wave dynamics. So we retain the key features of the Walker system, that is to say memory, resonance, and the quasi-monochromatic wave field, and explore beyond the range of the hydrodynamic system. And so the, this allows us, again, to connect to the quantum uh, pilot wave system. So this is a, just a parametric generalization of the hydrodynamic system. So uh, we basically have three terms. These are, the, again, the, this is the trajectory equation in its most general form. And so we have three terms. So there are two dimensionalist groups. One basically prescribes the, the memory of the system. And the second is the uh, ratio uh, of particle inertia to the other forces. Okay, so it turns out that so this can take on uh, any value in the lab, but this one is very strongly constrained in the lab. So it's between, it basically has to be order one. But you can ask the question, when do you get more quantum-like features. So what happens if this parameter is 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the 15? Can we get uh, more quantum-like features in other regions of parameter space of this uh, uh, sort of dynamical system, uh, this pilot wave dynamical system? So for example, when are hydrodynamic spin states stable? We saw they're unstable in the lab, but we can imagine they might be stable elsewhere. And when is the walking state unstable to inline oscillations, which we've seen naturally gives rise to um, uh, quantum statistics in certain settings. So we've indeed looked at this generalized pilot wave framework and found parameter regimes in which you get stable spin states. Um, and more generally, so if this, these are the two parameters, again, high memory here, low particle inertia here, you can get uh, spin states and more elaborate sort of processing spin states. Um, and you can also get the sort of uh, uh, erratic motion characterized by a random walk, which again is sort of reminiscent of Nelson's stochastic dynamics. So it's basically it's a new class of, of uh, dynamical systems, which we know can lead to 
naturally to quantization and occasionally to quantum like statistics. Okay. And that's just, the, that was the simplest parameter uh, generalization, which is meant as switching parameters, but you can imagine uh, looking at different waveforms, for example, and this has been done to an extent by Matthew, Matt Dury and uh, others group in Australia. And we've with Adam K um, under Sonny's uh, uh, wise uh, guidance, we've been looking at extending this generalized pi wave framework to 3D. So we're basically looking at that now instead of a two dimensional particle generating a two dimensional wave, we have a, a, a particle characterized which is emitting uh, three spherically symmetric waves, but it's it's uh, but it's becoming unstable on those waves and starts self propelling just as in the two D. Uh, version and sure enough, you get we get 3D spin states. So the particle will actually self-confine and move along a helical path. Okay? And so there are other generalizations you could put in some background forcing to try and model the quantum vacuum. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, the nice thing here is it allows us to connect to the pilot wave theories of De Bruyne Bohm. So just very briefly, this is the old hydrodynamic uh, interpretation of, of quantum mechanics, which is based on the um, Madelung transformation. So it's basically a polar transformation. You substitute this into Schrodinger's equation, you get a sort of hydrodynamic form. And in Bohmian mechanics, you say that the particle velocity is equal to the quantum velocity of probability. Um, and so all of the mysteries of quantum mechanics, you have the particle moving in response to classical potential and this quantum potential. Now this quantum potential is prescribed by the wave function. So it is therefore non-local. Um, and this has, was uh, criticized for various reasons. And so he later evoked uh, uh, or invoked uh, uh, a random stochastic forcing, uh, which he attributed to the role of the uh, sort of st stochastic quantum vacuum field. Okay. Um, but, and so the connection between Bohmian mechanics and the Walker system is interesting. So our dynamics is entirely local. But Bohmian mechanics, so as, as extended, again, this is work with Vigier, where he said, okay, we, it can't just be this, we have to have this stochastic element. So he has to um, <clears throat> evoke, so he has a non-local potential, which is of course troubling to those of us who believe in lo locality. Um, and he has this ad hoc um, uh, stochastic term. And we can see that if we break our, uh, this, um, wave potential down into a mean and fluctuating part, we can see that these would play the role of the uh, quantum, the non-local quantum potential in Bohmian mechanics and this stochastic forcing. Of course, ours is entirely local. So it could be that the, this de if one could de knew what these fields were, you could decompose this allegedly non-local potential into a, a mean and a stochastic point, uh, part and therefore gets uh, a local dynamics. Of course. So the other problem with Bohmian mechanics is there's no mechanism for wave generation, right? You simply, you know, you solve Schrodinger's equation, you get the wave function, then you calculate the quantum potential. But where is the wave coming from? And that, uh, to get a quantum theory which has that, you have to go back to uh, De Bruyne's mechanics. And so he imagined particles uh, oscillating with this internal frequency corresponding to the comp. Uh, to the Compton frequency, and this follows from the einstein de Broglie relation. So he then had particles moving in resonance with the guiding or pilot wave. So it's very similar to the hydrodynamic setting. And there are two waves. So there's the standard uh, statistical wave, which is a sort of emergent property of the system, but there's also a real physical wave, which he sort of viewed as resulting from the particle's internal vibration interacting with some background field, which we would presumably think in terms of the quantum vacuum now, that's the role, that the role of that is being played, of course, by the bath in our system. And so he found, so if a particle has, um, is, is basically a guidance equation emerges, so P equals H bar K emerges from this physical picture, and he stressed the importance of the, so the harmony of phases, the sort of resonance in the in the system. Again, again, but again, his theory wasn't complete. This is sort of a physical picture that he had, um, but he did not specify the manner in which the wave was created. And you can well imagine, it's difficult to imagine how a particle interacts with its own wave field. But now we have this hydrodynamic system, which uh, allows us to 
uh, to see how to get around some of the difficulties they had in modeling the, the dynamics of microscopic particles. Okay, so his physical picture, basically you have this fast dynamics giving rise to this quasi monochromatic wave field. You have this pilot wave dynamics for particle moving such that P equals H bar K. Then you have this long-term statistical wave. So again, his was a double wave solution. There's the real wave responsible for guiding the particle. Then there's the emergent wave uh, which prescribes the statistics of the system. So you see then the clear uh, analogy between uh, de Bruyne's mechanics and ours. The uh, bouncing is playing the role of the zitter bewegung at the Compton frequency in their system. And the um, surface tension is effectively playing the role of H bar because the surface tension prescribes the energy of the wave field. And this Faraday wavelength is playing the role of the de Bruyne wavelength in uh, de Bruyne's mechanics. Okay, and so um, <clears throat> the main problem with this, um, with these quantum pilot wave uh, theories is again, the mechanism for pilot wave generation. So that was completely absent from Bohmian mechanics. Um, and then also Bohmian mechanics has the problem of being non-local. We can see how we can uh, circumvent that problem um, with the perspective offered by the hydrodynamic system. De Bruyne's mechanics, um, he sort of uh, first said there were two waves and he's then later, I think when Bohmian mechanics was getting some attention, he said, well, maybe the, these two waves are just the same, in which case the, um, the theory collapses into Bohmian mechanics, which I think, and I think he was right. He actually came back to it in his final paper, he came back to his original theory. But of course, the big question is what is the, what is this matter wave field in quantum mechanics? So uh, the, again, the workers in stochastic electrodynamics suggest that, the, that there's a, that this is the coming from the, the background, that the matter wave field is the electromagnetic quantum vacuum field. Um, there are other possibilities, the Higgs field, gravity waves, there are no shortage of waves lurking around in the quantum vacuum. Um, de Bruyne suggested the field satisfies Klein-Gordon, uh, which we know describes the Higgs field. And this is sort of what, uh, this physical picture is what inspired uh, Yuval and, and later Matt um, in, in the development of our hydrodynamic quantum field theory. So basically, this is extending de Bruyne's theory informed uh, by the hydrodynamic system. So we've heard that from Yuval already. And so um, this did make it into the, um, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I'm happy to say. So it says that we're... Um, we've explored, this is in their account of Bohmian mechanics. It says we're coming up with, a, with another sort of hydrodynamic interpretation of quantum mechanics, but then it notes that our, our serious obstacle to the success of such a program is the quantum entanglement and non-locality characteristic. Of course, this is not just our problem, it's the problem for all of uh, quantum mechanics, and actually we see a way through um, non-locality, certainly, and entanglement in, in part, as we'll come to in my final slide. So, um, <clears throat> so again, this, so this hydrodynamic system, it provides a vehicle for exploring the boundaries between classical and quantum mechanics. It, exchanges the, it extends the range of classical systems to include uh, features previously thought to be exclusive to the microscopic realm. And most importantly, when we get these quantum analogs, you can imagine how something works, right? For example, in Yuval's HQFT, you see P equals H bar K. It's like, oh yeah, that's why it is. Um, and and so uh, it's not just saying, you know, that, that um, it's not simply that, oh, we've done that. In, in getting the analog, you can see what dynamical underpinnings are needed to, to uh, uh, rationalize these effects in quantum systems. So for example, the Friedel oscillations, right? You have speed oscillations as the electron scatters off and this gives rise to the statistical signature. Okay, and so, uh, but so this really demonstrates how, and we, you know, a key feature, and again, in the, on, if we go back to this thing, it says big challenges. Okay, non locality and entanglement. I consider non locality to be, we can understand it from this pilot wave uh, perspective. We've seen clearly how local hereditary mechanics, so local non Markovian mechanics, can give rise to behavior that appears to be spatially non local, but it's not. It's only appears to be non local because you're not taking into account the influence of the pilot waves. So, for example, wave function collapse. This is, you know, in, in the, the quantum interpretation is oh, we have this wave function top right, and then you, you 
observe where the uh, droplet is and suddenly this wave function collapses instantaneously to a point. How can that be? It's super luminal, wave function collapse. This is clearly a non-problem when you realize that there is a underlying dynamics. We've seen spooky action at a distance occurring uh, when particles interact with pillars and posts uh, as a result of wave mediated long range forces. Okay. Similarly, the, uh, <clears throat> in the double slit, the, par uh, the particle feels both slits by virtue of the fact that this particle is dressed by a wave which interacts with both slits. Okay, and we've also seen uh, the non-local, uh, the mean pilot wave potential we see is non-local because it depends on the statistics of the particle. Um, and we've also seen, and I wanna to touch on this in the remaining minutes, we've, all, we've been looking at long range correlations between droplet pairs. So here, this is work done by Andre Nashbin, who we're now uh, working with in an attempt to violate Bell's inequalities using the Walker system. So here you see particles, uh, this is the topography. They're basically in, confined to channels, but these channels are interacting through this intermediate wave field. And so after a certain amount of time, the particles become statistically indistinguishable, okay? And so, um, the, so we see that this system is reminiscent of De Broglie's mechanics, uh, but it also points out the shortcomings of the quantum pilot wave theories. In particular, we see a way around the non-locality in Bohmian mechanics through this hereditary mechanics. Okay, and so we've seen it's motivated a new class of theoretical models, heard from uh, Yuval. Um, and it's, for me, it suggests that the quantum paradoxes will be resolved ultimately through the elucidation of pilot wave dynamics on the Compton scale. And so this is, in terms of where we're going, we're again, building up the uh, uh, grocery list of uh, quantum, hydrodynamic quantum analogs. So we've recently looked at super radiance, established super radiance, which is seen by many to be a signature of entanglement. Um, with Valerie Frumkin, we're looking, we're looking at um, surreal trajectories this is a sort of spooky feature of quantum mechanics. And I, I really like the idea of writing a paper called Real Surreal Trajectories. Um, and then we've looked at spin lattices uh, recently with Pedro Sainz. And then again, I think drawing a, doing a really quantitative comparison between the governing equations in our system, the generalized pilot wave framework and the various uh, extant uh, pilot wave theories in quantum mechanics would be very useful. Again, we're extending things to from 2D to 3D. Um, with a view to get capturing more analogs. Uh, so basically exploring classical pilot wave dynamics in 3D. Um, and um, we've heard about the hydrodynamic quantum field theory from Yuval. And, <clears throat> and then the big thing is, so the way this is gone from the very outset is people say, oh, that's interesting, but you'll never do this. And, uh, and then I say, well, what is that? And then I go away and I study, and then we do it. And so the, the sort of holy grail is, of course, entanglement. Um, and so we're really focusing in on that now. This is work done with both Valerie Frumpkin and Konstantinos Papatrifonos, who is a wonderful um, um, postdoc funded by the Marie Curie Fund. And so Bell's theorem, and this is whenever I give a talk, people say, what about Bell's inequality? And there are those who say, that Bell tests have no, very, no bearing on the viability of hidden variable theories in which particles interact with the background field. So uh, part, Bell says, consider two particles moving freely. Well, in our view, they aren't, two particles started together are not uh, moving freely. They're interacting with the same pilot wave field. And so the question is, can we actually, my view is that we can violate Bell's inequality with the system. And of course, no one's gonna believe it until we do it. And then when we do it, they'll probably tell us that it was obvious. But uh, still, <laughs> we believe it's worth the effort. Okay, and so in so Bell actually believed he was uh, driven to Bohmian mechanics on the basis that he, he thought, okay, Bell's the violation of Bell's inequality. We must from that conclude that quantum mechanics is non-local. Um, and what's non-local? Bohmian mechanics is non-local. So he imagined that uh, this sort of physical picture that Bohm had, where you have this non-local potential. But what we want to show is that this quantum non-locality is actually rooted in hereditary dynamics. And so if you, uh, if you take that on board, then you can see that you could get the same sort of correlations. We hope that you can get the same sort of correlations through a local dynamics, okay? And so there are two different settings that we're examining this in. One is these two particle 
correlations in, um, this is basically just imagine 1D, this is a 1D setting. We're doing this numerically with Andre Nashpin and, and uh, uh, Constantinos and also Mathieu Labousse in Paris. So basically the particle is either in an excited or ground state, which is either the inner or outer cavity. So these drops are free to move between these two cavities um, and they, they can't tunnel into the middle um, because these barriers are too high, but they are communicating through this uh, intermediate channel, which allows the waves to pass through. And so the drops will become, so we found that there's super radiant tunneling in this system. That is to say the tunneling probability is altered by the presence of its neighbor. And this is taken by some to be an, in, uh, uh, an indication of entanglement in quantum mechanics. Um, and the key thing in terms of testing Bell's inequalities is identifying these well geometries with the measurement settings. So basically by changing the measurement settings and then looking at how the correlations change, we can test Bell's, uh, the, uh, Bell's inequality. And we preliminary studies suggest that we will indeed violate Bell's inequalities. And so come to the conclusion that others have come to before is that Bell's inequalities have no bearing on this class of dynamical systems. Okay, and the other uh, geomet geometry that we're considering is this um, particles moving uh, in these spin lattices. So we had a recent paper uh, out on the subject, uh, but basically these particles are confined to circular wells. So they either circulate in one direction or the other. And we show that you can get long range correlations um, with these <clears throat> with these walkers, depending on the system parameters, so on the geometry, on the memory, and so forth. And so, with this system, we expect that we'll also be able to establish. You know, we we showed that we can establish long range correlations, and expect that we can likely uh, violate Bell's inequality here also. So that's the long and short of it. And um, <clears throat> more coming at you. And if you'd like to, all of this is reported on my webpage. Um, and uh, thanks for your attention. I, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, John. You know how much I've uh, loved your work over the years. And it's just, um, uh, it seems like you're making progress so fast, actually. It might not feel that way, but you're, like you said, you keep tackling every aspect and uh, of, of quantum phenomena and addressing it and showing how you know, the hydrodynamic analog um, or the pilot wave approach um, more, more accurately can, can meet that. Um, what about the speed of entanglement? Right, so, so good question. So this is the whole thing like, you know, when, if you don't have this notion of hereditary dynamics, you say, they talk about the light cone, you know, these particles, they start the particles together and they're separated out. So they basically are separated. So they're outside of each other's light cones, right? But what right. is a light cone when you have a hereditary system? The particles have memory. They started together. They interacted through the same wave field. They're not outside of each other's <laughs> light cone. It's impossible to get outside of your light cone if you have a mutual memory. So that's the, the idea is this memory is going to give rise to the correlations that you wouldn't be able to rationalize otherwise. So the correlations are there whether we measure them or not is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there are, they're, they're baked in because of the way that the, you know, they were generated together and then they have the memory of the, the yeah. background so pilot. Can, wave. And of course you can upset this, right? Like if you, if there's some background noise, you'll wash away the correlations, which is why, you know, all these tests have, are, are very uh, fiddly and, <laughs> Right, uh, right. But, you can't have any that, background noise because, right. But but that is, I mean, that is kind of the the, the big picture is, you know, memory accounting for these uh, uh, peculiar quantum correlations using memory, and these hereditary systems are not widely studied, and it has, you know, in the in the context of dynamical systems, I read an early paper. They said, you know, this this should this class of systems should be looked at for as a possible uh rationalization for these peculiar quantum correlations yeah. so by hereditary is it automatically non-markovian that's right that's right yeah. sort of synonymous yeah right wonderful um i i hadn't heard of surreal trajectories <laughs> kind of like that's a cool name i i know can you, can you uh, say a little bit about what those are so they're basically bohmium. So there, there were trajectories which you get by um, 
or predicted by Bohmian mechanics. So Bohmian mechanics, so for the slit, for example, right? Bohmian mechanics through a slit, what you do is you solve Schrodinger's equation. You, from that, you calculate the um, uh, quantum potential, and then you have the particle, you have some you know, ensemble of initial conditions launched towards the slit and moving in response to this quantum potential, okay? And so there are some uh, trajectories that appear to violate um, conservation of momentum, but that are predicted by Bohmian mechanics. So they, on the basis of the fact that they seem to violate conservation of, of momentum, uh, of linear momentum, I should say, they were dubbed surreal. That is to say, they didn't believe that they could exist, but they have done the experiments now using this weak measurement. So Steinberg's group in Toronto, um, and they found that these surreal trajectories are in fact realized in the lab. And of course we would say they don't violate linear momentum because there's a pilot wave, right? And, right. So, so, and, and so, we do, so we do see the same. So basically we have the same setup as them we, the particle moves in a way that that would appear to violate uh, conservation of linear linear momentum if you didn't know that there was a pilot wave. Yeah. So how do they explain the violation? Do they they put it into angular momentum or? Oh, they they say it's only it's only a mystery if you fail to uh, take into account the non locality of quantum mechanics as expressed through the quantum potential. I see. So they basically account for this magical behavior using quantum magic. I see. Well, it kind of reminds me of conservation of energy, where once we figure out a source of energy, well, we'll conserve it and keep track of it. <laughs> but until we know it exists, you know, we don't go, you know, like if we look at uh, nuclear fission, <laughs> before we knew fission, we didn't know how to conserve energy in an atom. Now that we do, we conserve it. Um, I guess there's a couple. I just, uh, I guess uh, you didn't have a chance to hear uh, Larry Ford's talk, but he, you know, he has some interesting behavior. He's uh, predicting that from the vacuum, you can change, it, it can alter things like uh, the rate of barrier penetration. Um, you can get really fast atom recoils. Um, I wonder if your system can model some of that. <laughs> Here's another thing for your list. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly tunneling is something where, you know, you can imagine imparting a, you know, a stochastic forcing to the, say, the vibration, right? There are a number of things that can be done, and certainly it'll change tunneling rates. And that's, right. it's kind of, you know, that's, a, it's a big question. I know in stochastic electrodynamics, it's the same. It's like you, you <clears throat> to what extent, what you know? What's the relative importance of the cell field, which is the field created entirely by the by the particle, and the sort of the background field, right? Because right. I know in, in De La Pena and Cetto, they this is sort of a discu discussion, and the idea is that you know, in certain respects, the 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 particle motion is do dominated by its cell field. So basically, the there has to be some energy in the background, but then it's the inter it basically basically interacts with its resident wave modes and creates its pilot wave. But, you know, it, that this is going to be true. And this is true in the Walker system, right? Because basically there is no background field. The only, it's interacting exclusively with its self field, right? With the field of its own creation. But you right. can imagine like, again, a situation where um, there's a stochastic background field with which, which also alters its behavior. But as far yeah. as I'm concerned, it's kind of nice not to have to worry about the stochastic element and mm -hmm. just see, see what one can get purely from the self field. Yeah, in a more deterministic manner, yeah. right? Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of questions. People have their hands up. Uh, Zuni, did you have a comment or question? Well, because I was just going to say, because, yeah, uh, you know, basically, if staccato, you know, if, uh, if you can get everything you want with chaotic pilot wave dynamics, then one doesn't have to appeal to stochasticity, which would be nice. But sorry. Uh, I see. Yeah, to, to chaotic dynamics. Oh, yes, no. I see. Uh, 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 okay, yeah, no problem. Um, so uh, the, uh, you were talking about uh, the origin for this wave. Uh, wondering where that could be that uh, one of the first things was an EM wave. Uh, are those people who are supposing an EM wave um, also, also basing their uh, ideas on, say, uh, Wheeler-Feynman absorber theory? 
uh, like the transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, where because the Schrodinger equation is time invariant, uh, they said they suppose that uh, light waves are comprised of one half a wave going from its source to its destination forward in time and one half going from its destination to its source backwards in mm. time. Mm. So the so the transactional interpretation that uh, Kramer has came up with, I think in the 90s, um, ha, uh, you, uh, uses this to say that uh, all particles are surrounded by a pilot wa wave that uh, is always present since every time every one particle vibrates and creates a wave here every other particle in the andromeda galaxy say uh no know, uh, knows about it and produces their counter wave to create and the handshake that we actually see so uh is that what they were thinking of or uh no, i mean the the stochastic electrodynamics as I, as I understand it is you know the schrodinger equation is an emergent property you're really considering a particle with some internal vibration, you know, whether it's coming from it, some internal spin, one is interacting with the uh, quant electromagnetic quantum vacuum, th therefore generating a pilot wave. And, uh, and then the dynamics, they've shown that, I mean, it's rather difficult to follow because it has, there's a lot of sort of um, stochastic differential equations and so forth. But the the, the standard Schrodinger equation sort of is seen to emerge from this dynamic. So that's the, the physical picture. The, what you mentioned about time, you know, De Bruyne had the same picture about thing, waves going forwards and backwards in time, which I always found rather um, <clears throat> confusing. So I've never really embraced that, but, uh, and I haven't seen it explicitly in the stochastic electrodynamics. I mean, stochastic electrodynamics is pretty, is pretty sensible, common sense, uh, sensical in my view. So um, I haven't seen su such a discussion there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I guess uh, uh, Dr. Solomon has a comment or question. Yeah, when you're talking about mutual memory, Mutual memory, to my mind, implies communications, uh, whether there's this buffer that each is talking to or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, uh, you're saying you're staying within the light cone, which I would totally agree with. I'm, t I'm now approaching the subject of, uh, of special relativity uh, from the perspective of staying in the light cone, but then talking about different reference frames. And so a lot of the stuff I've seen, I was just wondering, are you talking about or honoring reference frames? Uh, or when we're dealing with the bell, it's clearly faster than speed of light. So we're kind of out of that SR realm. It's almost in conflict with it. And then your macro stuff, I was just wondering how you deal with the need or not need to deal with reference frames, which are the, the uh, bread and butter of special relativity. Yeah, I mean, I don't see it as, um, I, I mean, uh, so let, let me, I have a few comments there. One, I don't think you need to concern yourself with the, um, the, the basic physical picture of two particles starting together. Uh, being in community, they're basically communicating and, and establishing correlations by virtue of their mutual history. Um, I don't, you know, we don't rely on superluminal signaling, so I don't think the issue of frame of reference comes in there. But one place where GR does come in, which I think is super interesting, again, I mean, I, I'm a fluid mechanician, so I'm not too concerned what the wave field actually is. Any wave will do. Um, but I love the notion, you know, the, the sort of 2D presentation of a, of a particle curving space time, right? So you have, you know, a sphere, it looks like it's sitting on a, uh, on a trampoline. Uh, just imagine if that mass now is, is oscillating, will it not then generate ripples? Will it then not look very much like a droplet walking, uh, bouncing on, on the, a free surface? And uh, you know, sort of question we're thinking about is whether it's possible for a particle to uh, self-propel in such a in such a setting. So um, that's that's well, well. So that would basically be the gravity wave uh, interpretation of, of pilot wave. So it would ultimately leave 
to some sort of quantum gravity, but uh, this is highly speculative just, mm -hmm. just for fun, but I like the image. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Richard has a question. Uh, yeah, um, so mathematically we model um, our structures real similar to you are, you're trying to model in your descriptions. Um, we use a potential and then we use the same kind of wave fronts for a particle to write on. But we, our difference is instead of using a sphere for the particle, we use a rotating toroid. Um, and that way we're able to emulate things like connected particles um, at a distance where, you know, they could, their spins would actually align with each other and they'd have a standing okay. wave between them. So mm -hmm. how would that affect your model? So yeah, internal, I mean, that is, you know, a candidate for the internal vibration. You know, we're thinking in terms of, this bounce, you know, in our in the hydrodynamic system, the bouncing is creating the wave. But you could just as soon, you know, in the generalized pi wave framework, we had do have spin states. So you you could have a particle just zipping around, confined by its own wave, and that would then be this that internal motion. It would be the source of waves. And so this is what we're interested in doing with this three D pilot wave framework is looking at these interacting spinning particles. So it is true that they will they will interact through their uh, common wave field, especially you know if they have the if they're identical particles, they'll have the same frequency. So presumably be interacting with the same wave field. Yeah, yeah. Except the difference would be if you had a, a spinning toroid, looks like a sphere, but you're also going to have that extra harmonic underneath, right? As the toroid is rotating. Well, sorry, which which so, extra uh, harmonic? The so you would have or, instead of having a sphere that's uh, ro spinning and uh, and bouncing. Well, it would be oh. a rotating toroid instead, right? Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, we could, you could just throw out the throw out the bouncing motion there, right? You would just have yeah. that. Yeah, and that changes your waveform a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. But in the generalized framework, you can basically do do anything. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that was my question. Because uh, yeah, that's sort of my picture of what particles with spin doing do, right? So they're basically something zipping around. At the Compton frequency, that's the I think also corresponds to this classical model of, of the electron. This is basically a charge zipping around the speed of light at the Compton frequency. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. Uh, uh, greatly appreciate your talk and your work. Thank you, um, Charles. Yeah. Appreciate.